All right. So good afternoon, everyone, uh, and especially a warm welcome to our panelists. Uh, for our Cherokee viewers, Osio Nagadawu, Galiele Gaje Jidoa. I'm Dr. Courtney Lewis. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I'm also the current Andrew W. Mellon, visiting professor of justice, equality, and community in anthropology at Davidson College in North Carolina. I am also an assistant professor at the Department of Anthropology and the Institute for Southern Studies uh, at the University of South Carolina, where I work specifically in economic anthropology. This semester, uh, Dr. Rose Strimwau, who is an associate professor in the history department at Davidson and I are hosting a series of panels on native foodpreneurs and the food sovereignty movement. Uh, this is the second panel in the series, although it is the first of our panels to be conducted online. Uh, so I would like to express my sincerest appreciation uh, to our panel guests for their flexibility um, and also uh, to the support network here at Davidson for their help with this transition, uh, including uh, Ebony Stubbs, Amy Elkins, Daniel Lins, Ashley Ip, Sundi Richard, and Winnie Newton. Thank you all so much for um, helping to bring this uh, online today. Uh, today, we're excited to bring to an even wider audience than we would have reached before. Um, our Grassroots and Global Chefs panel. Uh, this panel is made possible by the Justice, Equality, and Community Initiative at Davidson College, uh, and it is generously funded by the Mellon Foundation. Uh, this panel features Chef Lois Ellen Frank, Chef Taylor Barton, and authors Johnny Sue and Sonny Myers. Uh, this panel specifically focuses on chefs who are deeply involved in the promotion and reclamation of native foods and native food ways. Uh, it reaches across the spectrum of chef experiences uh, from those who uh, dedicate themselves to serving their community to those who have expanded globally. Uh, I will begin by introducing each panelist, uh, uh, then they will update us with their own introduction of their current work. Uh, then we will move to discussion. Um, I'll ask our panelists a few questions, they can uh, discuss them together. After that, we will be taking questions through the YouTube chat window. Um, feel free to type along the way. Uh, if you're an audience member, if you have a question pop up, you do not have to wait until the end to type your question. Uh, you will need to log in in order to type a question um, and you can remain anonymous. But if you feel comfortable, uh, please do let us know your name, um, um, where you're located, if you're a student, faculty, staff member, alumni, community member, uh, we'd really like to know who's participating with us today. All right, with that, I'm going to uh, begin with Chef Lois Ellen Frank. Uh, Dr. Frank is an American food historian, a cookbook author, a culinary anthropologist, and an educator. She's won the 2003 James Beard Foundation Award for her cookbook uh, called Foods of the Southwest Indian Nations. This was the first cookbook uh, of Native American cuisine to win this award. She earned her PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of New Mexico, and she's an adjunct instructor at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, where she teaches classes on indigenous concept of Native American food. She's appeared on several TV shows, including Southwest Cooking with Bobby Flay for the Food TV Network. She has also started a Native American catering and food company named Red Mesa Cuisine. Uh, please do check out our website where we have linked to her Red Mesa Cuisine, page, which also includes uh, a link to her cookbooks and posters. Uh, so Dr. Frank, can you tell us a little bit, uh, just briefly an introduction to what you're currently working on now um, or your current concerns right now? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing now. I am teaching uh, via Zoom at uh, IAIA, so my Indigenous food class has gone from 
hands on to food demo, uh, but we've successfully done uh, mole and the history of mole. Uh, we serve that with uh, an herbed rice and uh, black beans with cacao. The students are learning all about cacao and how that was traded. Uh, we find cacao uh, well over a thousand years ago here in Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. And then we just finished uh, cactus. Uh, we did cactus three ways. We did cactus uh, grilled and then blanched uh, in a salsa, in a salad. And this week we're focusing on uh, elk that's marinated with uh, pine branches as well as an herb rub. And we will sear that and serve that with a sweet potato mash and a choke cherry sauce. So uh, we are um, working on indigenous foods. It's just that the format has changed a little. We're also working with the Flower Hill Institute here in New Mexico. And we're showing what foods do we have in our backyard uh, that's coming out right now and uh, how can we use those. So we just did a segment on uh, how to make culinary ash, the nutritional value of the ash. The ash is chock full of calcium. Uh, when we add it to our blue cornmeal or our white cornmeal or our mush, uh, increases the yield and uh, proves without a doubt uh, definitively that native people never needed dairy. We never had dairy. We never used dairy and the ash gave us all the calcium to build strong bones uh, that milk does. And then we're working with uh, companies made in New Mexico, encouraging people to buy uh, products from local vendors, the small mom and pop, the husband and wife team uh, that's out there harvesting or making a small product, especially during times uh, right, like right now, uh, where people are homebound. So uh, we're working on, on those three things uh, fairly actively. Uh, and then of course, uh, as, as it's warm enough, getting outside and gardening and pruning and really uh, being blessed and thankful for the, the plants coming in. Uh, right now we have wild onion shoots, we have wild currants, uh, our choke cherries are budding out, we've got buds, uh, um, blossoms are about to come, so we're really hoping no more snow. And then the yucca shoots are putting up uh, shoots which will yield flowers and we'll be able to harvest those. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, this is a really phenomenal time to be hosting this panel uh, and talking about food right now, although it means that I'm hungry most of the time. So, <laughs> all right. So our next chef is Chef Taylor Barton. Uh, Taylor is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, she was raised and is living in the greater Tulsa area. She has been involved with the indigenous community uh, culinarily for three to four years uh, and the downtown Tulsa culinary scene for the past 12 years, which is really an up and coming scene these days. Uh, she studied at the Tulsa Technology Center and at OSU IT Culinary Institute in Oak Mowgli, Oklahoma, uh, which is also where my older sister was born. So if she's out there, hey, Rhonda, shout out to Oak Mowgli. Uh, she continues to reclaim her Cherokee identity through cooking and connecting with her family and ancestors to keep the knowledge of Cherokee cuisine alive. Uh, and I'd also like to add that Taylor's grandmother has been featured on Cherokee Nation's OCO TV, making the very rich and comforting Cherokee hickory nut soup, Kunaji. Uh, and Taylor has also been featured on OCO TV for her indigenous dinners. Uh, these videos can be found on our website as well. Uh, so welcome, Chef Barton. Uh, if you'd like, tell us just a little bit about uh, what you're doing currently uh, and uh, maybe talk just a little bit about the uh, Indigenous dinners that you've put together. All right. Well, I'll start out with my little introduction. Um, Taylor Barton, Dagwa Doa, uh, and uh, Tulsa, DJ Gu'i. Um, so I'm from Tulsa. Uh, my name is Taylor Barton. Um, so my culinary um, journey did not begin in indigenous roots. Um, I was kind of basically under that similar umbrella that I feel like a lot of chefs start out under where um, like European influence is revered uh, and preferred. And so that's kind of the golden standard a lot of the time when you're in school. So basically um, that was the beginning of my career uh, working for small business owners um, and then kind of seeing that there is a, a large variety of cuisines that are available in the greater Tulsa area. 
But one thing that isn't is a uh, brick and mortar, um, solid Cherokee cuisine that is a contribute contribution to the Tulsa area. So there was kind of that absence of, for being a part of Cherokee Nation and um, basically being within their uh, nation's jurisdiction, there was very little to do with the culinary scene um, within Tulsa. So um, I had over my, uh, you know, lifetime had been impacted by my uh, indigenous uh, ancestors. Uh, my grandparents, Owen and Edith Knight, uh, they live in Stillwell, Oklahoma, and uh, my grandfather's lived 85 of his years on his allotment land in Stillwell, Oklahoma. So he's uh, lived on the same plot of land and it almost is something kind of funny is um just recently he's actually given me a little tour of exactly what does grow uh on this plot of land so we're uh, getting more familiar with the wild type cherries uh we know that there is a huckleberry patch that is in secret uh we do not share that with many people um well as the contacts that uh, my grandfather goes through to get his kanechi balls uh, which are the pounded, about softball size of the nut meat and a little bit of the uh, hole within it. And that's what we boil down. Um, if we're lucky enough to find somebody that produces those, it's getting more scarce, it's more sparse because it's a dying art. Um, but basically they, they take this nut uh, that is everywhere in Oklahoma uh, and in the Southeast. Um, and uh, it's funny that we use it for wood chips, but not the nuts. And that's, that's like the thing that is uh, well known about the hickory tree. But that's kind of like the beginning of my um, understanding of how my native uh, history has impacted my, um, my comfort foods. Uh, but basically that kanechi was kind of the, the, the ingredients that made me what I am today. Um, and having kind of that still that the memories of all of that impact me and set me on a trajectory. So basically, um, after my grandmother died, uh, I wanted to do something to honor her. And so what I did was I kind of, um, I brought it up uh, to the small business owner that I was working for at the time that was not indigenous. Um, I wanna do this. And for her, it was very foreign. Um, you know, like it wasn't something that just seems to be like a money maker um, at first. But then we found as soon as we started promoting this, uh, there were people that were starving for this, uh, that wanted it, that wanted more representation um, outside of the Cherokee Nation capital, which is Tahlequah. Uh, but Tulsa is only like maybe like an hour away. Uh, it's very close. Um, so we wanted to show that. And we got some attention from Tulsa World first off. Uh, and then because uh, people from OCO and Fire Thief Productions actually had went to school with the business owner that I worked for. They're like, wait a second, Tulsa World got to this before we did? Hold on. So that's why uh, OCO ended up coming and interviewing me. Uh, so we got a little bit of exposure on that. And then after that, like basically uh, all of my apprehension of joining this kind of like coming out as an indigenous chef, it almost felt like um, the indigenous cuisine and the culinary scene welcomed me with open arms. Uh, and, and there were chefs that really did kind of take an initiative and be like, hey, you should be, invo you should be involved with these things. So slowly over the past couple of years, I've been getting more involved with uh, going to, you know, summits such as the Intertribal Food Summit of 2019. It was an amazing experience. Um, and I got to really like for the first time in person meet a lot of these people that have been, uh, I've been connecting with over Facebook and a specific Facebook group, tribal, uh, so food sovereignty is tribal sovereignty. And that's where a lot of that basis of these people just became part of my family. And um, so I actually got to go to my first uh, spiritual ceremony, uh, like a, a Lakota uh, based, and experienced my first sweat lodge, basically. And these are things that uh, are very new to me, but also they're very important that I um, understand that this was part of, you know, kind of who we are. So uh, it was used differently throughout different tribes, but um, finally, like, you know, this native community wasn't standoffish. They did welcome me. So 
Um, so that was kind of my past. I have like a couple of goals going uh, forward. I did have a couple of projects that I did have planned, but the COVID-19 virus did stifle those things for the time being. But um, I have plans for getting a uh, website started and then maybe also uh, possibly doing some sort of my own enterprise that supports and promotes indigenous cooking. And my hopes are going forward is that if I make myself a parent and uh, like kind of speak my, my truth and raise my voice, I know there are other people out there and I want to find them. Uh, people who are uh, knowledgeable, knowledge keepers of the foods and stories that come with that. Um, so basically that's my goal going forward is to um, awaken the community, the indigenous cuisine culinary community within the greater Tulsa area, because there's people out there and I, I know they are, they're out there. We just have to find them. Oh, well, thank you so much. Yeah, well, we'll get back to some of this future stuff in just a minute too. And uh, thinking about where we're going forward uh, in this movement. Uh, so thank you, Taylor. Uh, finally, our, our final panelists are calling into us today. So if you can't see them, that is okay. Um, I will try to point out when they're talking since uh, for the live stream, you won't be able to see when their screen lights up. Uh, but finally, we are uh, very excited to have the cookbook author, uh, Johnny Sue Meyer and her husband, uh, Sonny Meyer joining us today. Johnny Sue is an Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians elder uh, whose passion for preserving her culinary heritage culminated in her first cookbook, The Gathering Place, uh, Traditional Cherokee Dishes in Southern Appalachian Cooking. Her specialties are the preparation of wild game meats, uh, the gathering and preparation of wild vegetables uh, in the Cherokee and Southern Appalachian traditions. She has been featured on Andrew Zimmern's uh, Bizarre Foods, uh, which is linked on our website. Sunny Myers works with Johnny Sue uh, as both a hunter and a photographer. It is his picture uh, that is the cover of their book. Uh, Johnny Sue's book can be purchased online at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian, as well as the uh, Koala Co-op up in Cherokee, North Carolina. Uh, if you need to order their books online, as most of us will not be doing a lot of traveling these days. Uh, we have linked to her book on uh, through the Cherokee Museum and they are shipping out right now. Uh, and that link can be found on our website. Uh, so Johnny Sue, can you tell us uh, just briefly about what you all are up to these days? Uh, maybe what plants you're seeing coming up in Cherokee right now? Um, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of screen sharing uh, to show her book and maybe some of the, the books that she, uh, books, some of the plants that she and Johnny are going to uh, talk to us about right now. Well, the weather has not been favorable here. It uh, is 70 degrees one day and 32 the next. So I think spring has finally gotten here because paid gatherers, and that's what we have here, uh, that go out into the woods, into the mountainside, steel tops, and gathers this food. And I'm, I answered your question, Courtney, but I need to introduce myself, I'm sure. Yes, my absolutely. Name Johnny, my name is Johnny Sue Myers. I was the look, my maiden name was Little John. I'm sure if y'all, the, the, those of you from Oklahoma are familiar with that name. And, uh, but I'm a Myers. My husband and I have been married. We've been together a long, long time. We raised five boys. Uh, I think we first started gathering, harvesting and gathering out of necessity, which uh, when you raise five boys that have healthy appetites and it takes a gallon of milk per meal, you learn to cut corners. So you... Uh, at your food bill. But I was just a young person whenever I uh, first started cooking. My mother was a workaholic and my dad, uh, who was also Cherokee, my mother was also, he worked in uh, up north, he belonged to the Union, 
And we always had store-bought food. I was uh, able to go into the kitchens of neighbors when I was just very, very young, like seven or eight. I was the babysitter for two sisters. My mother left me in charge, of course. We didn't have the tourism then that we have now, and that's unheard of. You don't leave your children at home alone. But I learned a lot from those women. One of the things that I learned from those women was cleanliness. When you prepare foods, you have to be very, very clean with your foods. Uh, that was, I guess that was the most important lesson that I've learned, at, and I'll be 78 in August, but what's growing now is ramps. Mm -hmm. We also have Sochan that's coming up. We have uh, Polk Salad, and I'm sure a lot of people kind of know about Polk Salad. I think Elvis uh, recorded a record way back in the late 50s, early 60s called Folk Salad Annie. Now that grows from Florida, east of the Mississippi, and grows all the way up to Canada. It's best to gather it before it gets real, real strong because the bigger the plant is, the stronger it has in flavor, texture, it's, it's just not what, what your palate wants to accept. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Then there's uh, ramps. Ramps. You done. What? Excuse me? You said ramps. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, those are kind of secret patches. People don't share that in, in information. Uh, quite as readily as they do Pope salad or any of that. So it can be a challenge sometimes to get ramps. Uh, five years ago, you could get a gallon from a paid gatherer for like $20. Now they're $50. So with pollution, with the pollution that we have in Western North Carolina, it's destroying food crops. And the name of my cookbook came about because these mountains are our gathering place to gather food, indigenous foods. My husband has always been an excellent hunter. He has kept our freezers full. We share with neighbors, with the community, uh, with tribal council, being called upon. And we also go and do tastings in different states and that's with wild game, and most of the time it's the venison. We, we use a lot of different foods, all kinds of different foods, but with the Appalachian, with the Europeans coming in here, and Cherokee, the Cherokee tribe welcomed them. They intermarried, uh, but the foods are closely woven together because they shared information. I had a grandmother, one grandmother that was German, and then I had one grandmother that did not speak English, and I never learned to speak the Cherokee language, so I knew who she was. My dad always taught us to respect her, and when we left, she would slip us a penny in our pockets, and that was in the 40s, and a penny back then in Western North Carolina was as good as a dollar. I'm, I'm serious. So. Uh, other than that, I think that's kind of briefly what I've covered, but I will uh, say that we do uh, use venison, like I said before, that my husband, we process. It was a long, long road, a hard journey. But we learned that you cannot go to the woods, to the fields, and get a deer and come home and cook it because it's, it's going if you if you prefer a wild gamey taste yes but most people that I know prefer a mild taste to their venison so we it took us many years to learn the exact process to process that venison so we now we don't send ours to a, to a processor we process it ourselves, which is a hard, difficult job if anybody's ever done it. 
but we grind uh, a lot of the, the meat. We cut a lot of it into steaks. We make beef stew. We make, uh, I'm sorry, not beef stew, venison meat for stew. We also make uh, tips, uh, venison tips, if you want brown gravy, mushrooms, and onions. So we try to utilize I try to utilize what we have at hand. We're not, uh, we don't live in, a, in an area where there's a lot of, uh, you have a choice of a wide variety of different spices and foods. So one of the spices that grows natural here is shoemaker, but it has to be the one with berries. The other one is poison, just like poison oak. You don't want to mess with that. But you take the, the berries from that shoemaker and you put them in a blender because they're hard on the inside. And what you're using, you have to make sure it's clean, you know, get all the sticks, debris, ants, nests, and all that out of it. You put it in a blender and you turn it on and that red fuzz that you get on the inside of your blender is your spice. And it is excellent for fish to rub with fish little butter and bacon. Perfect. That's we also make uh, fish, <laughs> catfish stew. There's, there's a lot of different things that you can utilize if you just pay attention. Anything else, Courtney? Do you have anything else to ask me? I probably went past what you asked me. No, not, not at all. Not at all. Um, you know, I'm just thinking in general... Um, and I'll, I'll put this question to all of our panelists, um, in addition to you, Johnny Sue, but what, what kind of challenges do you see for native foods right now, um, especially as a, a chef that's working with these foods, uh, feeding your community, feeding your family, um, and then with um, Chef Frank, maybe he can speak to you a bit about how uh, the challenges she faces on a more global level, but what kind of challenges are you all seeing right now? And this, uh, I should clarify, this can either be challenges in general, or um, we can also open up this conversation to what kind of challenges are we facing in getting food to our people during a pandemic, right? Um, so I will throw that out to you all. Um, I don't know if you wanna lead off Johnny Sue or if, uh, Anybody just wants to jump in on this first? Uh, you were asking about the pandemic. Uh, what do we do in the pandemic? Well, there's right. not very far that we can go, and uh, a lot of this stuff, uh, we just can't get to it right now on account of the pandemic. Right. right. Yeah. She mentioned some greens that uh, we have uh, branch lettuce, that uh, can be gathered. We have dandelion leaves that can be uh, gathered for salads. Mm -hmm. I think she mentioned the sochin. Okay. Uh, are you yeah, all? Yeah. So we gather those. We gather those by the bags full, and uh, we boil them down and and till they're tender, and then we we'll put them in freezer bags and put them in the freezer. So you've always got that, and, and the ramps would do the same way, and the pokes of it. Okay. I, I know that the Kuala Boundary, which uh, for our viewers is the homeland of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, um, has taken especially protective measures for you all. Has that um, kind of inhibited your ability to go out and harvest sochan or poke? Are you able to get out right now, or is that also under lockdown. No, we're, we're locked down, literally. There is one way in and one way out. The same way you came in, you have to go out the same way. Uh, with the cases that are getting closer and closer to the reservation, uh, I think we have some fantastic leaders that have the foresight to go ahead and, and close it. But we still have quite an area that we that we can choose from here. Pope salad grows, like I said, from Florida to Canada, and it, uh, it's up about 
12 inches, isn't it? It's up about 12 inches tall, so it doesn't take very long uh, to gather a bag full because the younger generation, they're not looking for it. They're not looking for it at all. The gatherers are only offering it to the elders mm -hmm. because they know, they, the, the gatherers know that the elders know what it is and we know how to prepare it. So, no, it's not difficult. Uh, we have fish. We have a beautiful, clean, clean river. You can see the bottom of the water on the rocks there to where if you want to fish, there's fish available. And we have venison la left in our freezer from last hunting season, which ended in January 1 of this year. But uh, the poke salad and everything else. But later... Uh, if, if the weather permits, because we had a drought last year and then the monsoons moved in on us in September. But if we have agreeable weather, there should be plenty because I've noticed that the blackberries are blooming now. The apple trees are blooming. Pear, uh, cherry trees are blooming. Uh, everything's growing. It's growing right now. But I really and truly, Courtney, it's going to take education to get to bring our tribe back to where they recognize the younger generation recognizes foods when they when they see them. They know how to. They're going to have to learn how to prepare those foods. Uh, I work. My sister-in-law, and she's Dr. Carmelita Monteith, right. and she's here assisting uh, with a lot of the school board and my sister. She's just, she's just really great. But she's working with the schools, with uh, teaching in gardening. She's teaches, she's helping uh, to teach the younger generation how to plant a garden, how to prepare. So later, I will be joining her on food preparation and preserving and canning. Uh, if this pandemic lets up, I know we're not going back to school until yeah. August. So there is, we just have to educate our people. You know, this is a tourist town, uh, and fast food moved in, and our obesity rate just about quadrupled. And I'm not, I'm not kidding. In yeah. our younger people, in our children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen um, some studies on that rate going up as well. Um, and I believe that now the uh, the Cherokee Central Schools, they have gardens at the schools, correct? Correct, they do. Um, so yeah, one of the challenges is uh, reclaiming this information for our people, not just in recognizing food, but also being able to prepare them, especially with foods like poke. Right, that need uh, a little bit of extra care when we, when we prepare them, right? Um, well, I've heard uh, uh, wives' tale stories on how to prepare folk. First thing you do is you rinse it, you get the sticks and leaves and stuff. I always rinse with mm -hmm. cool water anything that I'm preparing, whether it's venison or fish or folk salad. But you just cook it until you can take a leaf out of the pot and separate it. It means it's tender. It's ready. But we always pick our poke salad when it's up three, four inches tall because when you get it that, you know, young, it is delicious. You can mix it with eggs or you can eat it just plain. And I like to scramble if I've got a quart of prepared, pre-cooked greens in the freezer, take them out in November, December. Take them out, thaw them, drain them, drain them really good, not until they're really, really dry. You want to leave a little moisture there. Scramble six or seven eggs, put some salt and pepper in there. Mm -hmm. Little seasoning, you can use bacon grease, fat back, or olive oil. Just dump them in a frying pan and stir them up, and you've got a wonderful dish. And I, right now, one of my projects that um, I have to get it in my head before I can produce it, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking of doing a quiche with 
either, well, I may try all three, with Pope salad, sochan, and ranch. Not together, but three separate dishes. That's the next thing. Because well, kids, kids are finicky about what they eat, you know. If you have kids, you know that. But that's just one of the things that I'm working on. But let me know if you need a, uh, any tasters for that. I'm more than I will. to help us <laughs> need samples. Um, and I, uh, I see that Taylor had uh, something she'd like to add in as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I was just going to add in, like, a lot of these things that um, Johnny Sue Myers was bringing up. is things that, like, my grandfather, honestly, he grew up with. And he would tell me about, like, kind of, uh, like, this was poor people food in his mind. Um, but it wasn't, like, something kind of uh, saw at or uh, saw as like from the outside as a dignified cuisine but basically like um, I kind of had that same um, kind of resistance uh, whenever I first was one specific dinner that I had in 2017 since I was going to be opening it up for uh, public to purchase tickets to come to this event um, one, excuse me, uh, one obstacle that I had um, been confronted with is we cannot um, basically use uh, game meats in a restaurant setting because it is not from a farm of any sort. So they, I wouldn't be able to use the things that I was familiar with as being uh, meats that my grandfather ate growing up, which would be like one, wild caught crawdads. Uh, two, uh, squirrel, rabbit. Uh, he sometimes ate, like, raccoon growing up. Uh, he didn't say, though, like, I could get order in some venison through a purveyor. It wasn't by any sort of, like, hunting means. But uh, that was, like, my only, at one point, that was my only option to have protein that was, other than pork, which was a wildly accepted thing, um, but getting venison by ordering that in. And so it didn't really, honestly, uh, when I had brought that up to my grandfather as reference, as a cross-reference, because I ate venison growing up. But funny thing is, is like my grandfather and my mother did not eat venison at all. Uh, maybe like one time uh, growing up in Stillwell, Oklahoma, because uh, it was much more sparse um, and there was much more smaller manageable game that they would trap uh, or go catch like that was kind of my grandfather's task was to go out to kind of get the kids out of the house. They would send them down to the creek or the branch where it would be a slab. And then they would go and, you know, take their two prong um, little thing, little poker and go catch the crawdads. And they would eat that multiple times a, uh, a week is what I was told. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That that was uh, something that uh, our family, me and my two sisters grew up with as well. And there there is a trick to it. We can talk about that in the Q&A, but they are tricky. Um, so uh, Lois Ellen, tell us a little bit about, about what your challenges are. Are you facing the same kind of issues um, with actually being able to serve these indigenous foods? Um, or what other challenges are you facing right now? So um, I'm going to bring in a term, um, maybe some of the people viewing will know this or will not, but uh, what the other guests are talking about, first of all, food is definitely our medicine and the health of the land and the health of the people are inextricably tied together. They're linked. We can't have health of our people without the health of our land. Um, and really what, what we're talking about is a term that we use in our indigenous food class called TEK, and I always tell my students, uh, if you leave this class with nothing else, I want you to have TEK. And what this means is that all of our people, all of our communities, all of our tribes have indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. This indigenous knowledge is a form of science. This is what we call native science. And this native science tells us when to harvest, how to harvest, what is the protocol? Do we need to make an offering before we harvest? What is that offering? Some tribes use tobacco, some tribes use cornmeal. We talk to that plant, we talk to that animal. We never take all 
of the plant. We leave some there so that it can repropagate, so that it, there's enough for animals, so that there's enough for future generations. And so when we take this model and we give it validity and our elders take precedent in knowing that their knowledge is valuable, their knowledge is a form of science, all of a sudden we equate our science, our indigenous knowledge as being equal to that of Western knowledge. This knowledge is invaluable. And you know, we talked about, um, your other guests talked about the younger kids don't wanna do this. And so we once we give our ancestors valuable credit for the indigenous knowledge and we perpetuate that and we elevate it as to the same knowledge as any Western science anywhere on the globe, we create interest, we create hunger, we create wanting to know this knowledge. And you know, everybody thinks it takes multiple generations, one generation for something to disappear. If my mom didn't teach me, I can't pass it on. So I have no, no one to speak my language with. I, I can practice in front of the mirror, but I have no one to hear. I have no one to, to talk to. And so I'm very weak. I can hear the language. I understand the language, but I can't speak the language. Um, I know certain things, how to harvest, how to plant that was taught to me by my mom, which I can pass on. I can pass it on to my students, my younger generation, so that they can pass it on. But one generation, if we lose our language, our recipes, our songs, our stories. And so, you know, I'm going to bring this all into food sovereignty. What is food sovereignty? Well, food sovereignty is keeping alive our ceremonies, our practices, our food gathering, our food techniques. It, you know, in order for this knowledge to be passed on, we have basically, I think, four things. Land that is clean and unpolluted. All right, we need, so we can hunt, fish, harvest, collect, grow. We need knowledge. We need to pass on that knowledge. That's the TEK, that's the science. We need the ability and the right. You know, some of our foods now are on national parks or in areas where we can't go. Right now we're on lockdown, we can't go. So we need the ability to access these foods. And then um, we need education. We need classes, we need, panels like this where we can learn from each other and we can share you know TEK doesn't have to stay in one community we can share it so if I'm from one region I might know one thing um and that's where the trade routes come in we've always traded we've always shared um so if one person knows how to harvest one type of medicine or plant you know my background is we surround our, our lives with the bison our certain ceremonies choke cherries um but we know, I know for a fact that we traded with Pueblo people here in Northern New Mexico because in Taos and Picaris, they're singing our Kiowa songs. So we came down, we had relations, we were able to trade. So they had corn and chilies, we had dried meat, boom, there it is. How do we do that today? We can ship it USPS, we can ship it FedEx ground or, or UPS ground. I have relatives in the Northwest, they're shipping me salmon and huckleberries, I'm shipping them what I'm growing and harvesting here. And so I wanna keep, um, I, I made a note, I wanna keep in touch with Taylor and, and the other guests because I wanna be able to trade with them and, and keep that knowledge alive. And that's the circle of life. That is why this is integral and so important. It's, it's, it's just crucial to all of us. This is not divide and conquer. This is unite all color, all people, circle of life, four colors of corn, four races of man, four colors on the medicine wheel, and that's how we perpetuate this. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much for also bringing in uh, the TEK, the traditional ecological knowledge that's so important to understanding what's going on. Um, in our first panel, we talked a little bit about the issue with um, ramps and um, access to ramps, which for our audience members who don't know, um, are a wild spring onion that grows, um, and as well as other plants like sochan, uh, which are both located within parks that now outlaw the harvesting of these, right? Um, so we've talked a little bit about access as well. Um, and Chef Frank, you've also talked about this being um, more than just a local movement for you. So you really envision this as educating people 
globally um, on the issues of food sovereignty? Um, absolutely. And, you know, um, I, I love educating and um, I know uh, the one thing that, that, that where there's a dichotomy or there's like an internal conflict is we educate, but then we have to be very careful because if millions of people go out and start harvesting all of our indigenous plants, you know, I'm sorry to get so riled up, um, then there's not going to be enough for our native communities. So we want to be really careful. Communities first from the area from which those plants grow. And then if there's excess or enough, we can share with outside and non-native. So we really want to keep it native focused, but not being exclusive uh, to all people of, of all colors. We just don't want to rape and pillage. We don't want to go in and take everything. We want it to perpetuate and be available. And so you know, this idea of food sovereignty and, and food sovereignty is a non-native word, guys. This comes from Western academia. Uh, basically, you know, I printed out, so what is food sovereignty? Food sovereignty asserts that the people who produce, distribute, and consume food should control the mechanisms and policies of food production and distribution rather than the corporations and market institutions they believe that have come to dominate the global food system. So if I were to put that in layman's terms and do a short definition, this means we have the right, it's not a privilege, we have the right to sufficient, healthy, culturally appropriate food, not just enough calories, but culturally appropriate food. So my students always say, if I live across the street from Whole Foods and I can't afford to shop there, is that access? No, that's not access. So we need to have access to the foods of our ancestors mm -hmm. first and foremost, and then we need to educate others to help us in that. We need to buy the land back. We need to have permits to be able to go into these parks to get our sacred foods. And so there's a lot of policy. It's, it's, it, it becomes larger than just us. And I always tell my students, there's your job, there's your future. That would be a great profession. Become a lawyer to help tribes with rights or become an advocate or a food product company. There's a million ways for us to each take a role in this. And there's room for everybody. We need indigenous partnerships. We need other people, foundations that can finance us to perpetuate these foods in our own communities. And um, that's where all the colors come together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, kind of banking on that, uh, one of the, the outcomes of COVID right now is that many people are starting their own gardens, right? So we see a lot of people um, online, one, learning how to bake bread, <laughs> um, but two, um, really getting in touch with what it means to garden, even something as simple as lettuces that are going to come up quickly, um, that are going to produce for us. Um, so this knowledge is broadening out of this relationship to food a bit more. Um, unfortunately, kind of on the flip side of that, I've also seen warnings that um, with people anxious about being able to um, get fresh produce, that there has been a surge in interest for uh, wild harvesting, right? And this is one of the issues that has led to uh, the current ban on the harvesting of native foods in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park um, and other parks across the country. Initially, it was the fad of ramps, which are very slow growing, uh, which need to be taken care of, especially delicately when you're harvesting them. Um, but I think this is also why food sovereignty is so important. Um, and it's important for us to be able to um, control, um, not only control our rights to these food, but also make sure that people know why, right? Um, so when things like this happen, uh, whether it be a fad or a pandemic and broader mainstream society is suddenly interested in wild harvesting, um, with that interest, the first thing they learn is um, what comes with wild harvesting, right? Which is the responsibility first and foremost to the food and to the land, right? Um, 
So that's just one of the issues that um, we're seeing kind of come up a little bit here and there. Um, also with wild harvesting, if you're not educating yourself, you can become very ill. So uh, for those who are interested in wild harvesting, please, please do be careful to educate yourself, um, not just for the sake of the land and the plants, but also for your own health. Uh, we want to keep as many people out of hospitals as we can right now. I know you're going to move on to someone else. I just want to say one more thing before I burst. So, you know, um, <laughs> everybody in their own yard can harvest. There's two weeds. So take, get rid of the poison, stop spraying your driveway, stop spraying uh, your rockway, let those plants come forth. Dandelion, it, it, which was already mentioned, wonderful, wonderful medicinal plant, salads, teas, amazing. And another one called purseline here in the uh, Northern New Mexico, it's also called uh, Verdolaga, but it grows everywhere. So purslane is a succulent weed. It grows all over the United States. Um, you can dry it. You can put it in soup stews. Do not spray your yard with poison. And then every household in America can go out and harvest what was a weed, which is now a medicinal plant in their own yard. And all you have to do is let them grow, let them reseed and they'll come back. We don't need lawns anymore. We need dandelions. We need purslane. Um, purslane higher in omega threes than wild caught salmon. Everybody mm -hmm. can harvest this in their yard. So there's room for everybody to to do a, a little bit of this harvesting. We just have to help them identify those plants right in their driveway or in their yard or backyard or walkway or wherever they live. And let me just really quickly um, share a picture for everybody of uh, purslane. If you are all familiar, um, if you've had chickens in your lives, um, if you've had chickens, they love purslane. And this is generally considered um, a weed, but it's actually very, very nutritious, as uh, Chef Frank has said. Um, and of course, uh, the dandelions and dandelion greens. Um, again, the longer you let them grow, the tougher and more bitter they get as well. Uh, but the flowers are also edible and very pretty. Um, so just a little bit of screen sharing. All right. Uh, and I was going to uh, just ask Taylor a little bit more um, about how she's doing. Do you see, do you see any repercussions uh, with COVID um, as far as food is going, as far as um, accessing food right now? Um, what, what are you seeing in your community? Um, so I will first uh, kind of go back to Stillwell. Even though I don't live there, I do check in my grandfather very often. Um, I was very worried about him because he, after my grandmother died, he was by himself, um, just a man on the side of the hill, uh, 85 years old, um, still mowing his own lawn and stuff. But basically like his activities include going to town every day because that's all there is basically to do. Um, but I was pretty proud to hear, uh, that, um, he got basically, um, a whole package, a whole shipment of, um, vegetables, produce, uh, from Cherokee Nation. They're, uh, assisting their elders. Now it is not, uh, traditional foods. That's the only thing that I would be like, but basically they are accessing, um, and they are, uh, basically prioritizing our elders in within the community around Tahlequah and, um, you know, kind of on the outskirts of that area that people are indeed getting uh, kind of bulky, large. Uh, they're kind of, uh, my grandfather was like, what am I going to do with all this stuff? But basically he did get like some fresh vegetables and he did share that with his neighbors. Um, there was a list that people basically like kind of like a phone tree of uh, who to check in on uh, within the the community. Um, they are pretty spread out. I would say like all of the elderly people most likely live on their own plot of land kind of out in the boonies uh, like my grandfather. And so basically uh, I was very proud to know that people were checking in on him that wasn't just uh, the immediate family. We do keep very closely in contact with him, but um, I saw a shift kind of in his attitude even. Uh, at the beginning of it, he was almost a little bit kind of, didn't even realize if it was serious or not. 
um, maybe that it wasn't maybe stressed enough in Adair County where he was at the time, but over the course of like two weeks uh, after checking in on him a couple of times, his um, understanding of the risks increased. So hopefully that was part of kind of communicating to the elders within the um, Cherokee Nation uh, and letting them know, you know, how dire the situation was. Now they are not affected in numbers like maybe like Tulsa County is like where I'm at, but basically um, that's a, that's a red flag for me. I'm just very worried about him. Um, but uh, he, he's kind of older he doesn't really have like the ability to go out and gather um like he did kind of back in the day so he really just does stick with what he can find and what is easy for him to eat because he is feeding himself on his own um but in uh the greater Charles area um the restaurant industry which i was a part of very very closely was completely shut down um for weeks on end and it really did um, had I not had another position uh, with a, a fraternity when I was cooking, I would have been without a, a job for a month. So I happened to fall on good graces, but um, my culinary, my kitchen family in Tulsa was not faring as well as I was. So um, they were definitely feeling the pain, the impact of that in a monetary sense and an economic sense. Um, and they were very scared. Um, but we see more people coming uh, together in this time. And I do see a lot of more nonprofits that are banding together with people in the communities to get their food out to them. Um, like my uh, restaurant that I was working for, uh, they did end up giving uh, donated food to um, people in need, people who are of low economic means. So this wasn't a tribal thing, but this was just a uh, Tulsa thing. So, um, but you know, pretty proud of Cherokee Nation. They're, I do feel like they are addressing um, their elderly and in need. Fantastic. Yeah, that's that's really good to know. Cherokee Nation has been. Um, I'm not going. I'm not going to say lucky, but we've been hit uh, less hard than other nations. Um, obviously, the Dene um, are are having issues right now um, that that are pretty serious. Um, and I'm just going to, oh, let me interject real quick uh, for our audience. We'll be moving to questions in just a few minutes. Uh, so for our audience, if you have any questions, uh, please do jump up on the YouTube channel page and let us know. Again, you can remain anonymous. Uh, we'd love to hear where you're coming in from, um, but feel free to start posting questions. Um, and those will be shot over to me in just a few minutes. Um, but I'm going to move to Johnny Sue right now. So we have uh, Navajo Nation, which is, is having difficult time. Cherokee Nation um, has been doing a little bit better. The Eastern Band, um, as far as I know, does not have any current cases of COVID on the Kuala boundary, um, which is extremely extremely um, good news. But uh, Johnny Sue, how are people accessing food? Are you having any shortages? Um, because there's only the one grocery store, correct? Well, the only thing short that I've heard of is toilet paper. I'm not worried about the food. Food's coming in. It's just toilet tissue. So no, the food, the food trucks are running. They're, the, they're bringing them into the food line that we have here. But a lot of people are utilizing uh, the poke and the subchan and the ramp. The ramp season is almost over. So a lot of people don't, I guess, I really don't know how many people uh, put their foods up like we do. Uh, I don't know if they, they have a you know, uh, yeah. a need to put food up, but we always did. And as I told you before, necessity is the mother of invention. So that's kind of how I got into this business. But there is plenty of food here, vegetables. Uh, Sonny taught me a lot because he was in the woods with his family. I remember the first time I cooked 
cook Sally. I mean, so Chan for my dad. I was a cook in our family from the time I was about seven or eight years old. But and I learned. I, I made a lot of mistakes, but I learned. I burned a lot of food. But she told me to go pick Dad some poke Sally because he was coming in from the north where he'd been on. Uh, where he was working, but it was so Chan I was going to get. And she, my mother went with me, and she showed me, and she said, this is what you pick. Well, I'd never eaten any before, and I took it back to the house, and I rinsed it off real good, and I put it in a pot to, to cook, and when it cooked, then I put it in a frying pan, and put some fat back grease in it and some salt, and it was so bitter. And he ate it with relish. I'll tell you what, you I, I've never seen a man. He acted as if he was starved for that taste. So, as I said in my cookbook, uh, back to store bought foods. We didn't have any fast foods here. But I, I was wanting to tell you, I have a, I had a great grandmother that lived to be 114. She walked to everywhere she went. She raised her own garden. She didn't have a husband. And wow. she cared for herself. She had a victory garden, and she was featured in one of the newspapers out of Tennessee. But she had to carry corn in a sack on her back to the miller to have them grind it into cornmeal. Everything else she did, wow. she, she gathered and made or either did without. So, we're a strong nation. The Cherokees are strong. We're strong women, mm -hmm. and we have that ability. We, we can do just about anything we set our minds to do. Yeah, and... and it's going to be up to us. And my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at my husband. He's pointing at himself. So. I agree. He, he's done a lot of help. But, you know, together we've done this, but... I am just, I, I sit sometimes and wonder about, think about my grandmother and think about what a hard life she had. She lived on the hillside. She didn't have electricity. She didn't have running water. So she's a tough woman. And I'm just proud to be able to call her grandmother. And her name was Rachel Reed. Uh, I was going to tell you, one of the vegetables that the people that the Cherokees grew and introduced to the Europeans that came here um, was called a candy roaster. I think, did you pull a picture of that up, Courtney? I, I will put that picture up right now. Let me bring it up. It was introduced to the Europeans. Of course, it's a regional. It, it didn't flourish. It didn't go many places, but it can be purchased, and people grow it in North South Carolina, North Georgia, East Tennessee and Western North Carolina. And they're as good as a pumpkin any day. I make pumpkin uh, candy roaster pies versus pumpkin pies because it takes less sugar. We, we are overcome with people with diabetes. That, with diabetes. Mm -hmm. So that's about half of the sugar in a slice of pie than they would get out of a pumpkin pie. And like I said, there's, it's a it's a regional. Uh, some people eat it as a vegetable. Me, I use it as a fruit. So, uh, uh, do you uh, do you have any secrets for the best candy roaster pie, or no, or can you share them? Are you not allowed to share them? <laughs> no, that's that's what I have found out. I make uh, it's there's a recipe in my cookbook. Oh, okay. Candy roaster pie. There it is. And let me. Um, all right, so right now I have a picture of the candy uh, roaster squash up. Um, I also wanted to show a quick picture of uh, the sumac, um, just so people can recognize what that looks like. Um, and then I believe that um, Taylor had a quick question. So let me let me move to Taylor real quick for a quick clarification. Yes, I was going to ask, uh, basically, I see this picture of the candy roaster, and, uh, like, I've heard of candy roaster pumpkins before, um, but basically, this looks so much to me like the Gite Okosomen, 
like the big old squash uh, that the the revived seeds yeah. from like almost what they thought was I guess like got away with. They yeah. had taken these ancient seeds and grown a crop from that, and these produce giant squashes in like this cylinder shape, and um, it looks so similar to that. That's just what it had struck me as. Uh, but also like. Uh, the sumac as well i was gonna that had brought up when she showed that picture basically it reminded me uh my grandfather had finally just was like i didn't know what the word for that was but when i said sumac he was like that is exactly what that is uh and i had some people who had dried the seeds and it had a, a very citrusy acidic taste mm -hmm. uh that's why i was smiling so hard whenever you're bringing up putting it on fish because of that a lemony yeah that really does go hand yeah, in hand. Sour. It's sour. That very, yes, very sour. And uh, we made a tea out of it. Um, yeah. We made, yeah. It was like a lemonade almost. We had to sweeten it up, but it was kind of similar to a lemon. It was like a pink lemonade almost. Uh, but uh, we did this at the Chickasaw Culinary Academy last year. I was uh, the assistant chef uh, teaching like a small group of uh, Chickasaw students. One was Ai Wei, um, but we were kind of taking them under our wing and they're about 14, 15 year old children. Um, and we got to serve them the sumac tea and also sassafras as well, which it grows a lot on my grandfather's land, has that dragon claw looking leaf on it. And they would use that as a toothbrush as well. Um, they would chew the root because it was a, a breath freshener and it helped protect their teeth. It was in it frayed out like a brush so that they would clean their teeth with that. So that's all that I had to, to add on. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and let me just put up right now a picture of, I will share my screen, um, of the article about that squash. This is one of the, this is the accessible one, the NPR article uh, about the giant squash. Um, and you can read all about this online. Uh, there's been a lot written about it. Uh, so I do recommend that folks watching, if you haven't heard about this revival, um, do take a look at some of these articles. Um, and it looks like we have a question for Chef Frank. Um, so, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move into some of our audience questions right now. Um, this comes from uh, one of our anthropology majors at Davidson, Grace. Uh, she says that you mentioned the that the use of dairy uh, was not common, uh, which made me wonder if there's any connection uh, between contemporary food movements and indigenous sovereignty movement, um, such as uh, vegetarianism or veganism. Um, and I would just like to clarify for this question that dairy was not used uh, by American Indians. Uh, most or many at this point, American Indians are lactose intolerant. Um, and I can talk a little bit about the, the other movements, but this one's directed at you, Chef Frank. So I will let you uh, start out with that as well. Woohoo, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, we have to take the history and, and uh, what I've done is broken Native American cuisine history into four categories the pre-contact category from 10 to 15,000 years ago up until first contact. First contact varies depending on where you are in the United States, right? Yeah. We're all speaking what language. We know that that's a dominant force here in the United States. Here in the Southwest, we also had a lot of influence from the Spanish. So yes, these, these diets, there's a movement and, and uh, the students that are, are, are listening, we call it the Native American food movement. Um, where we band together and we help each other and support each other in these ways with land restoration and access, saving seeds, sharing those seeds. Uh, there are now, you know, when it comes down to it, seeds are going to be more valuable than money, guys, because money doesn't feed you. So seeds are a type of currency. They're, they're a great way to trade. We need to protect those seeds, revere those seeds. Uh, traditional farming practices, wild food gathering, um, cooking and nutrition classes. So we've started as young as five years old. We do a um, uh, part of the Indian education program, five to 14 year olds, get those kids in the kitchen feeling comfortable. I think, uh, I think it was Taylor that talked about, you know, access. Some of our elders can't go out and gather 
right now. So what can they make with foods that are from the grocery store? Can they take a carrot, which might mimic the wild carrots that we would have harvested in the past and make a very healthy carrot soup? Uh, what we do is we boil with water, uh, carrot, sweet potatoes, a little bit of onion, no cream, no dairy, uh, and blend it and you have a nutritious, delicious, inexpensive stew. It is vegan, it is plant-based. Um, I, people say, are you vegan? Are you vegetarian? My answer is no, I'm a nativore. So what's a nativore? I follow the diet of my ancestors. So lots of plants, roots, vegetables, weeds. Uh, I grow a garden, I do do the three sisters, uh, but I also eat wild game. So I've let go of all those commercial meats nothing raised commercially. I only eat wild game uh, or what maybe is grown uh, by my neighbors. So I'm not, I'm he heavy on the plants, lots of plants, um, lots of dried plants for food as our medicine, uh, but I'm still uh, utilizing uh, the wild game. And then that brings up Taylor and she's right, you know, as a chef, we cannot serve wild game to the general public uh, if it's not USDA inspected. But if we do a private event, so a community event where it's invitation only and it's not open to the general public, we are allowed to serve as a chef, something like that. So we have to differentiate between a public and a private event uh, as a chef and then uh, bring in some of those traditional foods or buy um, elk or venison. But you know, back to the dairy question, so think about it. Um, I don't know how many of our native ancestors went after a lactating deer or a lactating elk or a lactating bison and tried to approach her so that they, we could touch their udders so that we could milk them so that we could have butter or cream or yogurt or ice cream or cheese. Uh, first of all, that wild animal would look at us like we were probably some sort of native nutcase and then they would run away or charge us, depending on the breed of the animal. So we really didn't have dairy. So you know, uh, one of my students calls it blood memory, ancestral DNA. What was in, we're all native. We're all native to somewhere, regardless of what, what ethnicity we are. What did our ancestors eat and what are the foods that are most beneficial for us uh, today and how do we access those? Yeah, and, and just to bank off of that a little bit, um, so although we did not have access to animal lactation milk, um, what I've noticed in, in my journey of going back through Cherokee recipes is that we absolutely did have nut milks. Uh, so when we were producing uh, hickory nuts, right, we would have hickory nut milk. Um, we had all sorts of nuts that were used in the, the same way that it's interesting we see being unknowingly reclaimed by um, movements like veganism movement, right? So what we were doing as American Indians um, in you know, the, the continental or actually all of North America uh, was already using these kind of what are now today termed alternative milks. Um, and they were extremely healthy um, and delicious and creamy, right? So we were already doing these things. Um, and then as settler colonial society comes in and we um, are, we get broken away through governmental policies from the foods, Right. Um, and then put on to things like commodities, which are very, very dairy based. These this is when it gets integrated into the food system um, and the issue of uh, kind of these overlapping things with um, especially very vegetarian and veganism can get really complicated. Um, so if we have time at the end, I, I may come back to talk a little bit about that. Um, we do have some other questions, so I will come back to that. There's a lot of interesting complications there, um, but let me go to our questions real quick. Um, this is from Sanzari, a uh, student at Davidson who says there's a lot of mutual aid taking place within black and brown communities around food in the wake of COVID. Uh, are there efforts taking place among and between native nations to support each other around food. So do we see collaborations that are going on through 
um, the COVID crisis. Um, and then we will go on to kind of a, a broader question and I'll, I'll just throw this out uh, for all of you. Um, Taylor, I'll jump to you first. Uh, after that question, uh, Kathy, who is a Davidson alum is asking how we define indigenous foods. So that'll be our second question. Um, Taylor, if you wanna go ahead and um, talk a little bit about some collaborative efforts. Absolutely. So um, this is a this is a, an example of a friend of mine who is from the Navajo Dene Nation. Uh, basically, he has um, his name is Brian Yazi. He is from the New Mexico area, um, but he actually went up and uh, went to school in St. Paul, Minnesota, and that's where he has um, found himself. Uh, and that's closely in the area of the Anishinaabe culture. But he has found. Um, a kindred spirit uh, with them and is banding together with natives in the area uh, through, he does his own promotion, I believe. Um, I'm not totally certain on the, uh, maybe the donations or how he facilitates this, but he has been on a regular basis since the COVID-19 virus has come out. Um, he has been feeding uh, native catering food he's been catering hundreds of meals um and and dispersing them to the elders in that community and this would be foods that have the berries the nuts and this is no um dairy or flour involved this is uh you see this a lot in the um, food sovereignty movement that they will not have um a lot of these commodity ingredients like sugar flour white processed foods rice um They'll have wild rice, which is actually grass seed. Um, but basically they have been, uh, you know, shining above and beyond a lot of other people uh, who, you know, make, could take inspiration from this, but basically they do it at a community center and they disseminate that to their elderly, I believe in the Anishinaabe um, community. Great. Well, wow. That's, that sounds amazing and delicious as well. <laughs> Um, so we do see collaborative efforts happening um, as we all try to pull together to really make sure that people, especially uh, the elders um, and the, honestly, the younger folks get taken care of. Um, for our next question, um, Kathy joining in from Brooklyn, how do we define native foods? Is it anything that's native to a place or a region? Um, and is there a crossover with the slow food movement? And this was specifically aimed towards you, Chef Frank, and myself, but I will I will let you go. So Woohoo. Okay. So how do you define uh, native foods? Uh, uh, there's no definitive answer. Um, we're going to go back to the TEK model. So uh, foods, from a specific ecosystem or ecozone, environmental area surrounding a community or tribe. So each tribe has not only perhaps their own language, but their own foods. There is some crossover, and then there are some uh, general uh, ingredients that were traded. Um, I teach my students about the magic eight. So eight plant-based foods that many tribes shared and then traded. And those would include corn, beans, squash, also called the three sisters, although that metaphor differs by tribe. Here in the Southwest, that is not the same metaphor as it is on the e in the East and with the Eastern tribes, both to the North and to the South. Um, so corn, beans, squash, chilies, tomatoes, potatoes, vanilla, and cacao. So up until 1492 and that encounter, uh, collision, however we want to paraphrase the um, Columbus exchange, what we do want to say is that he did bring our ingredients to the rest of the world. And as native people, we gave these foods to the rest of the world. These foods are a great foundation for health and wellness. Um, I work a lot with urban Indians. Um, we are now in our colleges, 75% of our students are now uh, not land-based, reservation-based, they're urban-based. And so what we still want to do is have everybody identify and have access to something that's native. So we do a lot of immersion work 
with these indigenous plants that were shared with the rest of the world and how, because they're accessible. So if you're in Brooklyn, uh, you might not be able to grow or dig or harvest some of the indigenous foods to those areas, but you could take the magic eight, focusing with the three sisters and bring in some of those foods that you could access in your supermarket and, and form a native foods diet based on your area right now. And Courtney, you wanna? I, I, think, that, I think that does pretty well actually, yeah. Um, let me see. So here's a question that's, that's a little bit related to this and a little bit related to um, another question that's coming up. Um, and I, I think all three of you, or all four, excuse me, all four of our, I'm looking at three windows, all four uh, of you present can, can kind of speak to this in your own way. Uh, one of the questions from uh, HD, another student at Davidson, um, says that given the complexities of access to and barriers uh, facing Native nations trying to control both their own food and land, what are ways that um, non-natives can ethically consume native food. So I'm thinking here um, that Chef Frank and Chef uh, uh, Barton can speak to this a little bit on, on a higher level. Um, I know Johnny Sue can speak to this as someone who lives in a very, very high tourist area. Um, so Chef Frank, if you wanna um, speak to that a little bit, then we'll move to Taylor and then to Johnny Sue and Sunny, yeah. Um, so this is great because this ties in how do non-native support, uh, we want to form indigenous partnerships where all colors can support the native agenda. I call an indigenous partnership where the native agenda takes priority. So um, what you could do is go to your farmer's market and encourage those farmers to buy some of the heirloom foods, uh, which would be anything where you can take that seed and replant it. A hybrid is sterile and we're supporting seed companies that are crossing things that we cannot perpetuate. Anything that's heirloom, you can go online. As a non-native person, you can go to Ramona Farms uh, in Tucson, Arizona. You can go to Tamaya or the Santa Ana Grain Mill. Uh, you can go to the Navajo Nation. You can go to Native Seed Search and you can buy indigenous seeds, indigenous plants. Uh, Ojibwe, we can buy hand harvested wild rice by native people on a canoe, the way it's been done for thousands of years. When we buy these native products, we support the mom and pop operations and we perpetuate the TEK associated with them. So let's take wild rice, okay? You buy a pound of wild rice, it's expensive, and you might think, wow, it's a little more expensive, but what does it do? Well, you need the canoe to go on the lake to get the rice. You need a lake, so you need the environment. So you're saving the environment in the same way you're helping build the canoe to get the rice by buying just the pound of rice. Then you're perpetuating the songs, the prayers, the harvesting, the winnowing, the hulling of just that one product. Anytime you buy an indigenous seed that's grown in an indigenous way, you perpetuate everything associated with that seed and you support a native community and a native organization or a native family. And so I advocate, yes, um, we may run out. Maybe as a native small mom and pop, I have a husband and wife that harvests wild tea. They run out. Be prepared that they're gonna run out, but support those organizations first and foremost. And then what we do is perpetuate all the knowledge associated with that. Um, and I'm just gonna move to, excuse me, Johnny Sue real quick uh, and Sunny um, and just ask them, I, you live in a very high tourism area. Um, how can we, um, how can we feed uh, non-natives and tourists and visitors to the Kuala Boundary? How can they consume indigenous foods ethically? Or do you see a way for that to happen? How, how do you translate this to tourists? Well, it's, it's yet to happen. Uh, one of the problems is with the meat, and I'll let Sonny explain that, but usually here it's fast food. So we have some, some good restaurants, some good chefs at the casino, but other than that, it's 
normal menu. Yeah. If, if you go in, if you see a restaurant that's advertised in Indian dinners, yeah. it's usually chicken, bean mm-hmm. bread, cabbage, and fried potatoes. Yeah. Yep. That, and, and nothing. You know, there's nothing there native about it because the cornmeal is usually refined. The beans are pinto beans. You know, they're from somewhere. Yeah, yeah, from the supermarket. But there's nothing native about it because, as far as I know, we didn't have chickens and eggs back then. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's false advertisement, but they stay busy. They stay busy, and they say, oh, I love that native food. Well, it's not native food. But one of the problems is the venison, and I'll let Sonny go into that. We we don't have many here, and it's slowly making a comeback. White-tailed deer, that's usually what we eat. So I'll let him talk about the hunting and the, and the venison. Okay. Okay, uh, Courtney, I didn't introduce myself a while ago. Um, I'm uh, Sonny Myers. Mm-hmm. Uh, my parents lived here on the reservation when I was born in uh, 1945. Mm-hmm. And uh, small game, I would say, was uh, very scarce because everybody here hunted for the same small game. But then we, about when I was five, we wound up in uh, Haywood County. And you couldn't get a job. There was no jobs in, on the reservation, hardly. And then over there was very few more. And I think my dad worked for 50 cents an hour at that time. But small game was our primary meat source. But the problem was everybody in the neighborhood was hunting the same game. So they were trying to feed their families, too. But anyway, we had, uh, every once in a while, we had a squirrel, a rabbit, or maybe a groundhog. But there were no raccoons. So then, when I was 10, when I was 9, we moved to Florida. Mm -hmm. My dad got a job down there making a dollar an hour, and we thought that was big money at that time. So we moved to Florida. And there was rabbits everywhere. There was squirrels everywhere. Mm-hmm. You could hunt just about anywhere you wanted to. You could fish anywhere you wanted to. So yeah. then we got into hunting small game down there. Mm-hmm. We found a place to hunt wild hog. Right. And we could catch... Uh, I don't know, four or five different kinds of fish, uh, soft shell turtle, mm-hmm. plenty of raccoon. They were everywhere, too. So that's how I got into to eating the wild meat. But mm-hmm. I didn't deer hunt until we came back up here. Okay. And I met Johnny Sue. <laughs> I don't know if it's good or I think about 53 years ago. <laughs> And uh, I had people that lived in South Carolina, and we'd go down there and visit, and I got into deer hunting then. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. But you got to know how to take care of them. At first, we'd just, I'd bring them home, I'd uh, dress them and and bring them home, and then we'd cut them up, wrap them up, put them in the freezer. But when you tried to cook it, it was tough. Very. So I kept on doing that for a while, and I thought, beef is the same thing as deer. It eats the same stuff. So I talked to a lot of farmers. I know a lot of farmers that raised their own beef, and, and they got to telling me that if you take the oldest beef in the pasture and you feed it corn for about 30 days or 60 days it'll be the tenderest beef you ever ate so I thought well 
how could you tenderize a deer? So when they take their beef to the market, they want it hung 14 days or some of them want it 21 days. Mm-hmm. So then I figured out I have to tenderize this deer. Well, we tried coolers, but you put it in a cooler in about 10 days, it'll start turning black. So we couldn't do that. So I yep. thought, well, I'm going to put it on ice in a big cooler. So I'd layer the meat in the cooler, ice it down, and then layer meat and ice that down and put plenty of ice on top. Mm-hmm. And I would drain the water every two days, add ice if I needed to for seven days, and then I'd take it all out and turn it over and do the same thing again for seven more days. That's 14 days. Wow. Then I process it. Now, you've got to take the glands off of it because it will turn the taste of the meat bad. Right. So you got to know where they are. And they're around the neck mm-hmm. and in the hips. Mm-hmm. So uh, I do the grinding. I, I take the meat and I, I call it uh, saran wrap. Every muscle has got a clear wrap on it and I take all the muscles apart and take that wrap off and I take all the fat off Mm -hmm. and then I process the deer I grind it I cube it I slice a a stew stew meat off of it and then I'll take the bones that's got meat left on it and I'll pressure that for about 25 minutes, and then I'll take all that meat off and make soup. Right, right. Veg, deer vegetable soup. And I'll do the same thing with the right. stew. We just cut it in larger chunks. But there, it, that's what I was going back to what uh, Dr. Frank was saying. We don't have any deer here mm-hmm. that's just slowly coming back. And one of the things that, that wiped the deer population out here was we did it to ourselves. <laughs> the Europeans were in great need of venison hides, deer hide, for shoes, hats, vests, pants, jackets. And they would exchange, it would have to be a five-foot stack tall of hand hides to trade to a trader for a musket or an iron pot. So, as I told you before, Courtney, trust me, women are women regardless of whether they live in Cherokee or if they live in New Mexico. If my neighbor had an iron pot, I guarantee you I would have an iron pot as soon as possible. It's greed. That's, That's what wife the venison ear out and like I said it wasn't because of the Europeans it wasn't because there was a disease came through like killed the chestnut trees it was yep. greed it was our own greed mm-hmm. but uh, we've eaten everything you see who was it said they hadn't eaten a raccoon we've eaten raccoons we have eaten armadillo we have eaten alligator we have eaten well, I'll put it like this. We've tried everything that's within our area of travel <laughs> except a snake or a possum. And I just I just can't can't do those two. Oh uh, well well there's time. If your grandmother lived to be hundred and fourteen, then uh I think you got a lot of time to try a lot of <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, she could make a good soft shell turtle cake. Uh. <laughs> I have de- developed different recipes for different things. The first time that I do a new recipe, mm-hmm. I have to just get the feel of it. I want to get the feel of the texture of the meat, the smell of it, uh, how long it takes to cook, if it's going to be tender, if it's going to be tough. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it takes a while. Uh, you just don't jump up and come up with a new recipe, or I can't. Other people may be able to, but I can't, especially if I'm using uh, 
vegetables, and I use vegetables in the soft soft turtle cake. So, mm-hmm. yeah, we I, have, I we think have ex- go definitely ahead. something that that every chef struggles with, <laughs> right? I think we all do have at some point. You do. Yeah. And um, I think that also it's a, it's a good note to wrap up on just thinking about part of the challenges of being a chef and accessing these foods is the fact that they do take a lot more time to process. You're not buying from um, a factory farmed piece of beef, right? Um these are products that need to have been tested like the soft shell turtle, like the processing of venison, right? These take a lot more time. They take a lot more effort. Um, they can't, we can't just access them immediately, right? Um, so there are a lot of challenges to this. And I think uh, all of our panelists have really uh, kind of tackled some of these challenges as chefs um, in accessing these indigenous foods. Um, And we are uh, over our time a little bit, so I don't want to make anybody late for their next Zoom meeting, which I'm sure we all have coming up. Um, But I do want to thank everybody uh, for listening in today. Um, And for all of your questions, I'm sorry I didn't get to all of the questions, but hopefully we touched on a lot of the themes that the questions talked about. Um, And finally, of course, I would like to thank our panelists. Thank you all for being so flexible uh, with moving this to a live stream format. I'm really, really happy that we could get you all back to do this panel. Um, At some point in the future, I would like us all to meet in person. um, And I hope that won't be for very long. Uh, But again, just a very warm, uh, deep appreciation for all of you joining us today. Um, thank you so much, uh, and thank you to Helen again as well. Thank you, Dr. Frank and Taylor, Johnny Sue, and Sonny. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. You all take care now. We will. Stay safe. Uh, I will try. You all, you all try to stay safe as well. <laughs> okay. We'll talk right. to you later. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.